Welcome to All Things Community. This special session, the special episode, you want to call it workshop, you want to call it an AMA, you want to call it whatever, um, is coming to life because um, Hannah just reached out to me recently and came up with a bunch of interesting community questions. Uh, how to build community virtually, how to do it in the post-pandemic world we live in, what are some core tenets that um, you know um, guide you towards building a buzzing and engaging community. All of these topics, all of these themes that I think are super interesting and valuable to someone who is just getting started you know, in the community space. And I talk about this all the time. I've given answers to this in many, many forums, Twitter spaces, Clubhouse, um, AMAs. But I really thought, you know what, this would be a fun episode just on its standalone to do with someone who is just curious like you, Hannah, and uh, package this into a, a beautiful piece of content. So that's the, it, that's the aim here. Uh, why don't you, first of all, welcome. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself to those who, who, who may not know about you? Great. Yeah. I mean, hi, KP, again. Um, my name is Hannah or Hannah. It's, it's, you know, I get, I get confused people. Um, I am an experienced designer at um, Think Company. Think Company, super high level, is a digital design and development consultancy. So I'm there doing mostly UX for a client. Um, and I mean, yeah, I think that's like kind of my little intro, but we'll, we'll right. do more. Yeah. Give me, give me a sense of, um, first of all, shout out to Think Company. And I think they're um, grooming great talent like you. It's, it's a really um, awesome to hear that. But give me a sense of like what got you super interested about community in the first place. Yeah. So it's one of those things where you, where I started to realize I was already doing it without the title. It's things like I'm thinking about friends of mine, family members, what would they love as a gift? How do I organize my friend groups in thoughtful, purposeful ways? How do I communicate intentionally over text and email? So I'm like already in that headspace. And then this one of my favorite comedians, Alex Edelman, shout out. Um, he has this interview where he says that becoming a comedian was his way to commercialize his ADHD. For me, it's commercializing my social anxiety. That is not me being flippant. I was actually in a social anxiety group therapy in college. Um, <laughs> so it's channeling like real life experiences to then help other people feel seen and heard the way I've been lifted. And one other little shout out is I grew up in a Jewish community, very tight knit in person, going to synagogue every week, do no, no longer go to synagogue every week. But mm -hmm. I think that's a really formative experience for me of like mm -hmm. the power of being part of a community where it's you're noticed when you're not there, your absence is missed, the fact that you were there mattered. And like, it's, that's kind of, I think a lot. And I think I have, to, I have some like, talking points. I think one other piece of this too, it's like, yeah. I, Wanted, when I in college, I was almost a philosophy major, was not a philosophy major in the end, got talked out of it, it was impractical. But it's like this idea of using other disciplines to inform this, where it's like, what do mm. philosophers do? They identify key assumptions and then create, equip people with the tools to evaluate those assumptions. So it's first identifying what is the assumption? Is it a good assumption? Borrowing from those other disciplines and be like, you know, what's a community? Like, how do we build it intentionally? which I think would be a great segue to hear more of your thoughts about that topic. But right. this idea of just integrating the, all these parts of myself that were already there right. toward a purpose. Um, I love that. I love that. And I think, you know, first of all, a note on, um, you know, growing up, uh, growing up Jewish, you know, I, I, I grew up in India and, 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 you know, I think a lot of um, uh, similarity that I see in, in, in Jewish culture and Indian culture is, is this tight knit community aspect, you know, which, um, which is so foreign to most, you know, non-Jewish, non-Indian setups, I think, which is interesting because um, you're, you're right. Like, you know, you, you practically are raised around a lot of people and um, you, you're expected to, you know, know a lot of them, like get to spend quality time with a lot of them, a lot of cousins, a lot of uncles, a lot of aunts, you know, and sometimes it can be annoying because you're like, oh my God, there's so many, like, you know, have you been to an Indian wedding? I'm sure, I'm sure it's like the Jewish wedding too, just like oh, insane. Oh. Going to right? wedding is is a life goal. <laughs> I know it is it is one, but so I think there I I feel maybe that was one of the subtle subconscious uh, drivers in my life. You know, we, I joke about this with my mom that you know you she prepared me to be this community leader growing up because you know she threw me into this bunch of like <laughs> you know uncles and aunts and like cousins and everybody and like expected me to function. I was very shy as a kid, and 
Um, it's just so <laughs> funny and opposite of who I am now, right? I'm 0% shy. I don't, you know, I have like no, uh, like I don't see any barriers to strike up a conversation any, 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 anymore. You know, my wife jokes that uh, I could talk to a wall for 10 hours. I could talk to an Uber driver. I could talk to somebody on the plane. She's like, can you please shut up, right? But I think that's that's because I was raised in that setup. And the, my only way to connect with someone was through a conversation. Yeah. Um, and sometimes when you don't have a lot in common or at least on the surface level, um, a conversation, like I used to be really stumped about what can I ask? What should I talk about? And then I started becoming more empathetic yeah. and stood back and said, maybe I should not be talking. Maybe I should be asking questions. Because then like they are delighted to answer. Yeah. And that <laughs> leads me to my next part of the convo, right? So it's, it's a great experience of ping pong style back and forth like you need to understand how much should you ask and how much should you listen to keep a conversation super light and super delightful so with that premise i know you got like a bunch of questions a lot of themes to talk about let's go i'm really excited to to answer them yeah. in public amazing great as am i to hear your answers and kind of chime in so I think one of my buckets is this idea of high level framing. What are we even talking about? So what is community? What is it about at its core? What is an online community? What, what it is, what it isn't. Um, could, and then, so maybe there's like, you know, t- buckets. It's like, what is this thing that we're talking about? What is it? What isn't it? What are some of the creative constraints and opportunities of remote versus in-person? And what's at stake if we don't get better at this? Mm big topics. And I can also, you know, break those bullets down, but that's the very, or you can just kind of jump in as you right. say. No, I think, I think they're great. Let's start with the bucket that seems most exciting to you. Oh, I mean, so, so I want to, I want to, I really want to get you talking about this idea that was valuable to me from our previous unrecorded conversation, the three C's community consulting, coaching, and how to think about those, this, you know, that, that framework. Right. That so the framework that I have with community uh, came from, you know, I don't know, like three, four years now building communities, you know, um, both when I was at On Deck and now I'm, you know, um, at day one, which are both very, very founder centric um, and community centric businesses. Um, I think what I was referring to in our last conversation, Hannah, which you just brought up again, is I think at the core of a community business, um, your promising slash selling transformation. The product is a better you. The product is the customer comes in and they're experiencing this community. They are part of this and they feel connected. They feel belonged. And when they walk out of it or when they graduate, which is, first of all, there's no graduation, yeah. but let's say there was, let's say some artificial graduation. Um, the, the, what we're really selling is a better you. That's why it's always an epic pitch. Who doesn't want a better you, right? Would you not want to buy or meet or see a better you? Of course you want. So it's an insanely compelling pitch when you put it that way. So the 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 final con- sort of conclusive um, aha moment I had when I was writing all these landing pages and creating all these you know, marketing pitches and everything for all these community businesses I've been building is that, oh, so it's not that they want to be part of no code community and no code niche or founder, early stage founders or future founders. All of these are just labels that are mm-hmm. superficial. That's okay. You know, that's probably like the, just a talking point, but really deep down they're yearning for a transformation. So a great community promises and delivers the transformation at a personal level. Now a great community also knows how to scale this um, by making it not about the the program team or the person, the face of the community, and it's all about peer-to-peer transformation, right? Like, so I think that's what makes it uh, compelling. So the three C's I was talking about was, I think in in these three, this this not this uh, framework extends to, of course, you're selling a transformation framework extends to, of course, community, but also it extends to consulting. You know, when you're doing consulting with clients, um, it's the same thing. You're you're essentially selling them a better version of them. Um, same thing with coaching, you know, I think even more so with coaching where clearly they're in there because they're struggling with something and they want to be a better, you know, X, whatever that X label is, better dad, better communicator, better storyteller, better marketer, better designer. Um, that's what coaching is. So I think these three are unique in my view and where the conversation is so much about transformation and and uh, personal growth. 
as opposed to other products and services and marketplaces. Like if you go to Uber, you know, it's more transactional. It's like you're getting a utility right yeah. out of it. Uh, you go to Amazon, you're buying a product, literally a product. Um, it's, and so these three C's I was talking about the other day, I think are the product is the transformation. That does tie in then to another distinction, this idea of what you were describing as um, like the 50-50 dance, where it's like, here's our big, huge ass, pro sorry, I'm not going to curse on this. Here's our huge promise, you're going to be transformed. But to deliver on that promise, you as the customer need to bring yourself and bring your yeah. commitment, et cetera. So, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about, or rehear your thoughts, yeah. this gatekeeping versus curation framework. Yeah. So I think, well, let's touch on this. Um, we'll get to the gatekeeping, but I'll, I'll tell you why curation slash gatekeeping is necessary. Because when this promise is laid out in front of this customer, we're saying, hey, do you want to meet your better you do you want to do you want the transformation do you want to get to that next stage in your you know personal you know growth the implicit understanding and agreement is that we're you're meeting me halfway you know i cannot do the work for you i cannot do the um important um sometimes uncomfortable um growth related work without your consent without your opt in so i think the implicit agreement is that um because it's so much about it is personal transformation, self-development, like personal growth. It so much about the success of this relies on your participation and willingness to step up to this journey. And any community coach or consultant can only do the 50% of it. Yeah. The other 50% has to be a handshake from you. Yes. Right. So I think that is very important to communicate from the get-go. That's partly the reason why I've done, you know, 350 or 400 interviews for every cohort of 100 people. Um, and partly why I was in the loop when, I, when they, they were signing up for the fellowships or mm -hmm. community. Um, and it was not a self-sign-in because it would have been easy to like simply put a sales page and say, just, just do a self-checkout and, you know, you don't, need, you don't need me to tell you this. But... Sometimes people need to hear this. People need to remember um, that it, it, there is that 50% implicit uh, agreement that they need to bring to the table. Um, so it sets like realistic expectations of what the journey will look like, right? Yeah. They come in much more prepared. They come in knowing that, oh yeah, I got to bring my best self to this too. I can't just like expect to be spoon fed. And so I think the, the, yeah. the worst communities or the, the, the failure, you know, scenarios are those where, um, it, it, there was no proper handshake slash mm -hmm. um, what what is it, or agreement check. or a pulse check as well. Yeah. It's a like, pulse check around like, what is the expectation yeah. of this journey, yeah. right? Then it creates very unfair expectations on the other side. The customer might expect that they're being spoon fed. And I think great communities, you know, there's no, there's no question. There's no, um, there's no scope for spoon feeding and doing the work for you. You know, you have to do half, Meet, meet halfway. So that leads me to this gatekeeping um, topic that we talked about the other day. And you said you, the premise was like, I think great communities are gatekept as a necessity, not because of um, poor design. I think I was, Let's I was, I um, maybe real quick, the term gatekeeping versus. Right. I was about to reflect on that. I was about to reflect. I would say, I said like, I think gatekeeping probably is a harsher term. I, what I would have preferred, and I know you, you know, you align on this too is curating yeah. as opposed yeah. to gatekeeping because gatekeeping is this artificial scarcity that hey i have a nightclub at the corner in, in downtown i can only we can only take 42 people but really like it can take 95 but you're just like creating artificial scarcity right that's not what we meant or what we both mean in this scenario we're saying uh, we can only you know accept those who understand this implicit or explicit understanding as our first cohort or second cohort yeah. and if you are not there yet, if your life or current circumstances are not allowing you to step up and bring that 50% of what we, you know, what we discussed, maybe we'll see you in three months. Maybe we'll see you in three, you know, four, four, three, four quarters. And that's okay. But it's a much better um, alignment with the customer or community member than simply letting anybody come in. And everybody has very different expectations of what this is about. Mm -hmm. And um, you're never going to, serve and delight anybody because they'll come with the very different expectations.
that and that then super ties into this idea of when you are curating, what are those traits you are looking out for? Mm-hmm. And it's things like also one thing you said specifically is not the quick extraction of value. I yeah. love that phrase. So anyway, yeah, it's the attributes you are seeking to collect <laughs> into a community. Right. I think this is um, a little bit subjective. I think everybody has probably their three, four favorite traits, but I think broadly. Um, a great community has more givers than takers. In my ideal world, a great community has 95, 96, 97% of givers than takers, which means givers are people who are nurturing value, uh, fostering communications and relationships. Um, they're basically gardeners. Um, and, and, and they're like doing this as a sense of serve, spirit of service. You know, they're like willing to serve others. They're, they're, for them, the community is bigger than themselves. Um, this is the ideal world where I would, you know, we would attract a lot of those people. And I, I know they exist, but you have, you need to put the bad signal out there in the world to attract that persona. You know, you have to call it out explicitly that we're looking for people who believe in the spirit of service, people who believe um, in giving first before taking, taking value, people who believe in paying it forward. Those are the metrics that I used, you know, when I was doing, when I was building uh, on the no code fellowship and like some of the other um, fellowships where, I clearly, one of the first things I put out was um, we were looking for people who believed in um, giving first, you know, like, it's almost like you are the kind of person who, when, when we were just about to jump on a call, you're the kind of person who asks, how are you doing? How can I help? Whether you say those words or not, but that's what you're thinking. Mm-hmm. And there are so many people like that. And imagine a highly dense community of 50 to hundred people who are all about this mindset. Yeah. You know, that's the best place to be in, right? Cause you're like constantly you know, it's a great support system. It's a great network. Yeah. I think of it as being like hearted, this idea yeah. of people who share like a spirit versus like minded. This is a nice. concept I came across from Alan Jacobs. He's a writer nice. of the book, How to Think. And yeah, this idea that it's like people who share that spirit. And it's not about do we all think the same things, do we have the same opinions. It's like we're all in this with a certain aligned approach. Yeah. No, well said. I think that also allows you to attract a diverse set of. Um, personas and characters that are beyond like your, um, you know, like ICP, ideal customer persona, right? Which is, um, there's, here's this mom who has this, you know, four kids. And like, I think tra- traditionally marketing defines personas are, uh, defined personas are almost like caricatures of people uh, as opposed to like, to your point where you are sensing for or checking for something a bit deeper than a mom with four kids and a, and a uh, pickup van. Like who cares? That's not the point. The point is, like, what are some things that she believes in? What yeah. are some things that she's um, looking for in terms of like uh, a connection? You know, what, 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 where does she feel home? Where does she feel belong? If we can retrofit um, or if we can like reverse engineer from there and then create a community space that uh, highlights those, you're going to attract men, women, all these types of people that you typically think that don't, don't come together. Right. So the other fact, the other thing I have to say about traits, right? So one was this, you know, persona, the giver persona. The other thing that I always thought was interesting was um, have you um, taken some action on trying to get better in this transformation? So that is uh, probably a bit harsh of a, of a criteria, but it was important for me to use this at the first cohort or the first ever batch. And I loosened it later um, because like, if you don't have enough doers Mm. in the community, we're going to turn into a bunch of pundits on national television, you know, <laughs> right? And so because everybody has very opinionated, fancy, um, yeah. you know, word garlands of thoughts, but but have you done anything about it? Have you given a shit? Have you taken a, have you like built something? Have you taken a shot? I'm not saying you have to code it or you have to no code it. You have to create a prototype, and like really ship it, publish it. But show like show me the last 14 days of your like, do you have, there's this thing called knowledge action gap. A lot of people actually have the knowledge, know what to do, but they don't act on it. Right. So if you're surrounded with people who have a really large knowledge action gap, they're going to drain you because they've <laughs> mentally thought through all the processes and steps and like, you know, how many ways this might not work. And they don't have this childlike curiosity to go do stuff. Right. You know, like when I spend time with my kid, Neil, who's, you know, 15, 16 months old, he has probably the world's smallest knowledge action gap. If he thinks it, he does it. 
sometimes to his own detriment. But if he thinks it, he does it. Like literally, there's nothing stopping him. Sometimes I have to get in the way and like throw myself to stop him from unplugging a cord or some, turning off something else. And I love that about him because yeah. kids, if you spend time with them, you realize that they have they go they give no shits about other people's opinions. They don't have self um, over processing filters. Yeah. They don't judge themselves too much, and they just over, they don't overthink. Yeah. You know, have you ever met a kid who overthinks? Never. They're just like when they think it, they do it. Yeah. So I think <laughs> that was my second trait: is that am I surrounded in a am I cre- am I attracting the kind of people who are more doers? And I actually respect imperfect action over perfect deliberation. Yeah. So that is, I think, another great trait that you know you're surround, you know that can be a yeah. foundation of a good community. I want to give a shout out to my manager, Sean, where like a week or two ago, I, I raised all these ideas, like amorphous concepts, my passion for connection, et cetera. And then his thing is like, do it. Like just start, like start doing the things you want to see done, like, and see what happens, experiment. And and just, you know, don't get too bogged. Because I was like, do I become the director of community? Like, is this a... Right. Is like, it's like not about the title. It's and yeah. is that even is that even like the way to get this? You said this earlier. It's like how do you how you design the community is itself an expression of its values. It's like, do you even want like, oh, that's the person who's responsible for community? Like, no, like that kind of, like that's kind of antithetical to yeah. the vision. So then I think I think in like in most things, when you have a vision, you know, here's my here's my thing. Something I struggle with per, uh, personally, and I'm being sort of super vulnerable here. Oftentimes I get frustrated that I have a certain vision for my own transformation and I will, I have, I think I have a pretty low knowledge action gap, which means I will immediately do it. However, there's a huge ass gap from action to results. So that's the part where sometimes I'm, you know, frustrated about where I'm like, come on results, show up. And, um, you know, and, and if I look back in the last 10, you know, 10 years, especially the last four years, especially, um, a lot of my results, a lot of my like disproportionate outcomes came after um, consistent effort for a really long time, yeah. like an uncomfortably long time. <laughs> However, there was some inflection point that would happen towards the end and suddenly all, it's like when it rains, it pours. Yeah. It was like it's unfair at the end, insanely unfair to me and everybody in my peer group that they're like, how KP has this Midas touch. I'm like, I don't have the Midas touch. It's just the way it seems like to me the universe works, right? Like where mm. it, the real test is, first of all, knowledge action gap. Are you a doer? Are you going to even do something? But the real, that's like a small, the real big test is how long will it take for you to give up? And that's a testament of character. I think if you really care about something, you never give up. You know, like Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in jail, right? He really cared about it. There was no shortcut to it. So if you really care about something, you would never give up until it shows up. However, you have to live with the reality that you're not seeing the results that you want to see so that you can feel um, accomplished or complete that, hey, yeah, I am actually doing this and it's happening. Um, And my answer to this, my own frustration, my answer to this is like, you know, when I'm frustrated, I listen to hip hop. I'm like, what is the philosophy in hip hop that I can borrow, right? Which is funny that I even said that out loud. But I love that, yeah. There's an amazing uh, phrase, or I think amazing verse by Kanye West in this, you know, epic song called "Power," which I keep coming back to all the time, and where he says, "Reality catches up with me," and I feel like a lot of my life is that, where I'm living in the future <laughs> state of my transformation, and I'm already doing the things that I would want me to do, and future me to do, and. However, the reality hasn't caught up with me. So I'm like waiting. Yeah. Now I could do two things. I could wait impatiently and be every day a grump, grump and like just the like gruffy and grumpy and like, oh, you know, why is it? Or I could just like play tag with the reality and saying, you can never catch me because I'm always beating you because I'm always one step ahead. I'm always living in the future, you know, and I'm always pushing my skin myself to go do something that's probably a little bit bolder than what I did yesterday. But so. What- yeah, that is sort of to me a game as opposed to an impatient like oh god, I have to wait for the results. There is like so much to to, to pull on what you just like so many things. 
one is like we said that character is interesting because it is character but it's also clarity of purpose right mm -hmm. it's like yes why am i even doing this what what is this thing i care about making it really simple and 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 retrievable it's like this is about people this is about like yeah. and so when you have this like kind of go to not slogan but like little thing it's like oh this is about like you know the so and so if you'll see and seen and heard this is like and then it's about purposeful goal setting because it's like yeah is my goal to become the director of community? Cause guess yeah. what? That's out of my control. Like that. Yeah. Okay. okay it's recording. Cool. Awesome. Okay. So where and were we? I'm in with like a quick little reframe. Yeah. What just occurred is that, you know, KP and I were like chatting, like riffing. It's great. Feeling inspired. Boom. A modal pops up. It's like, you need, like, this isn't working. You need to refresh. Ah, interruption. And it's like, Oh, I don't want that to be happening. But then it's like the how is the what, right? It's like how we feel in, in this conversation and how we're connecting. It's not about is this going super smoothly? Like, oh no, like, there's, there's a wrinkle in my plan. It's like KP and I are going to bond on like how we're going to troubleshoot this annoying situation and not like panic. Like, so I love that example of not being too attached to specific outcomes, but being mm. present and like in it, like in it for the ride of like, right. What spirit do I want to bring to this? Oh, it didn't go exactly as I wanted it to. Okay, let's figure out. And it's like, you know, just how you approach it. Right. No, it, it's, it's also another like superpower um, that you can have when you're running communities or, you know, interacting with groups of people, right? Because there's always a, an excuse to panic or excuse to freak out, excuse to be anxious about. Um, but you set the tone in as the leader as as you know the you know as one of the faces you don't have to be the face but like you can set the tone of how people um will feel by being an example right so that's that's a that's a great insight there so i think we were going back to what we were riffing on earlier um you you talked about the titles you talked about the roles in community and i think if you remember i shared an example last time when we talked that i didn't even know that there were community roles three four years ago and I was just uh, serendipitously um, hosting a few mm -hmm. meetups in Atlanta. And also, by the way, I never thought of myself as a meetup guy, host and kind of thing. I would go to some meetups, grab the pizza and get out quickly. But um, <laughs> what happened was I was trying to become, so another transformation I was in, you know, um, I was, you know, part of was trying to go from being an idea person to being a maker or indie maker, indie hacker while keeping my full-time job uh, safe job to pay the bills. And I had a visa reason at the time. Now I don't. I'm grateful that I have a green card. But at the time I had a visa reason that I needed to be in that job full time and I needed the money for paying the bills. So with this constraint, which could be, could, which could be viewed as a handcuff or whatever, um, I put a positive spin on this and said, okay, this is what it is. I can't change it right now. However, nobody can stop me from doing what I want to do after 5.30 p.m., Mm -hmm. when I leave my workplace and I can do whatever I want from there to all the way until I go, go to sleep in the night or in the morning, wake up. So, so I would go. And so one of the transformations I took on myself was I wanted to go from being a non-technical idea person, pundit. As I said, I was joking earlier that there's often too many pundits in the world, very few doers. So I wanted to be a doer. I wanted to be a maker. So I joined um, an online no code thing and, um, I was like learning some no-code stuff and I was building some things. But when I was building these projects, side projects, I needed someone to sort of like to riff on or riff mm -hmm. off of and, and have a sounding board or share my work and get feedback on. And so I initiated a, because uh, I was at a co-working place called Atlanta Tech Village and I saw a bunch of people meet, you know, every week, whatever. And so I initiated a small meetup um, and I borrowed this concept of indie hackers from indiehackers.com. Um, shout out Cortland Allen, who's the creator of it. But he, there was an Indie Hackers Atlanta chapter, and they were meeting. They were they were meeting for years, but suddenly they stopped that year for some reason. Then they were looking for a host. So I, pro I was part of this online community. So I said, "Hey, I'm can I can help with, you know, setting this up. Maybe you know, if you guys want to come down, and we can do a show and tell on what we're building, all of us." The main host who, who was supposed to be the in charge of this, and I was a co-host, um, ghosted 
and didn't show up on the first day because whatever happened in family, whatever. So I became sort of the default face of this meetup. I, I was not signing up for it. And I loved being the face of it because I was like, oh, I could do however I wanted. So I redesigned the way I wanted it. There were like four people at a noisy bar uh, yeah. outside the ATV thing, I said. And um, that was our first ever meetup, Atlanta um, Indie Hackers chapter. And I became the chapter captain, self-given title. And <laughs> But my favorite part was I loved it so much. I went back next month, invited more people. And I was not a big shot then, so I didn't get like a lot. But four to seven, seven to eight to we dan- we ran it, I think, 15 months nonstop. I even hosted a meetup three days before my wedding, much to my chagrin of my wife, my current <laughs> wife, my, my then girlfriend, because he was like, are you out of your mind? Like, we have a wedding to plan. We're doing all this. And I was like, no, no, no. I, I gave them my word. I got to show up. I'm the host. And uh, and so that's the commitment, right? When you have a grand, bigger purpose than, you know, um, than like, hey, outcomes, you're committed to the practice of doing it. And the funny thing is, in one of the final one of the final sessions we had, we had the founder of IndieHackers.com, uh, the very famous Cortland Allen, who has a podcast and he's like a big big uh, tech um, you know figure. He showed up, surprised us. He showed up as uh, one of the guests, and he brought his mom and his brother, who I didn't know were also in Atlanta. And he said, like, KB, hey, this is one of the best meetups I've been part of, and he's seen like three four hundred meetups. Um, and I quickly pulled a chair, made, made, him, made him sit and said, let's just do a quick impromptu fireside mm. chat. And we had, I didn't have any questions prepared. I spoke my heart out. I just like asked him the curious questions that I thought I would, anybody would want to know. 45 minutes later, he walked up. Um, he, he stood up and he came to me and he said, it's probably one of the best conversations I've ever had. You have a podcaster in you. And at that time, I, was, I didn't know anything about podcasting. I didn't know anything about community. So, but I, I had these seeds planted in my head that I could be pursuing these two things at some point. And mm-hmm. it took like another two years for me to really give a shot with building a community, which I did at On Deck. So a lot of the times, you know, the title, the role, all of these things will come much later, you know, than your action. You got to get in and do the action and get, get in the feel of what it feels like to be that X person, whatever that label that you want to give for yourself. And reality catches up with you and suddenly you will give, you will be given that job offer that you're looking for and they want you to do the thing that you've been doing for two years, you know? So I think that's been my um, blueprint. It's just do the thing and let the titles come to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, so many threads to pull on, but I think this idea of like a thought partner is one of just like, having people to riff off of also what people reflect back to you is very informative of like and and you being in a headspace that you listen to it and don't just dismiss it right someone could be like you're amazing at this thing and then you're like they're just saying that i don't know but when you're you're listening you're like someone tells you you realize like you care about people and that shows yeah and you're like oh and they're like that's not a given like that don't take that for granted yes what do i do with that information that this person just and like it needs to come from other people because you can't myopically yes. understand how yes. you make it feel. So when you're getting all this input and then you're like, oh, like that's interesting. And then the other thing about what you said, it's like, well, this, I, I don't know, this, something you said made me think of this, this idea of like, we don't know our own blind yes. spots. So we need to loop other people into the, com- I, I, I think in do all these experiments, like some a little subversive and, but like, li- like little, little mini like experiments at exploring what it means to cultivate intentional spaces. And um, I have, I have a, a lot of ideas. So sometimes I'll like gut check with my manager or with a few other very trusted, very wonderful people like Keith and like Sela. I'll be like, Hey, like, this is my idea. You get like a, a, a pull, like a gut check on like, is this feasible? Should I scale it down? And what I'm learning is I tend to like get very excited about big ideas. And then it's like, uh, that's ambitious. Let's like rethink it a little bit or like, 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 and that's so important. Like I wanted to have a 30 minute talk about purpose. Okay. I wanted to have a 30 minute brainstorm session where in 30 minutes, you know, eight people come into a zoom call. I already designed a fig jam board. Shout out to fig jam and Figma for the work they're doing in building. Amazing. 
Um, so Fig Jam board. In 30 minutes, let's have you plop into a Fig Jam board you've never seen before. It's massive with huge topics to discuss, huge, very personal as well. And then do your little stickies for 10 minutes and then spend 15 minutes in a group discussion. You know, that was my format. And I share it, I share it with Sean and Sayla and they're like, um, that's ambitious. And I don't know, talk about like very well phrased critique. They're like, I don't know if this is going to help you get your desired effect, yeah. like it, it, impact, you know, intention versus impact. Very big, you know, phrase that I've learned. Shout out to Josh Stewart for introducing it to me. And it's like, my intention's one thing, but is the format I'm I'm right. fostering? I think, know, I think that. I'll say one thing there. And let's unpack that actually a little bit. The format, a lot of the times, I, I tend to do this sometimes too, where the format, we download the format from the society because we mm -hmm, think mm -hmm. the format is what makes a blockbuster. So if you and I were, let's say, up, up and coming budding screenwriters and we've just moved to uh, Venice Beach, Hollywood or whatever, and we want to make the next big, I don't know, iconic cult-like movie, you know, there's a lot of rush and a lot of a sense of like desperation to download what Quentin Tarantino did. Let's just download what he did. Let's, but Mm -hmm. really great iconic filmmakers are extremely authentic and unique that they don't download that shit. I mean, they will probably like, of course you, you can ins be inspired by them and all that stuff. But what I've learned over my career is if you're trying to pack so much into something so, sh so short, like the 30 minutes example, or in my case, for example, like when I started my podcasting career, I was trying to like pack so much wisdom into one episode you know, and I want it to be like Tim Ferriss, you know, because Tim Ferriss, when you listen to one yeah. of his stuff, yeah. I'm like, oh my God, blown yeah. away. But the yeah. world already yeah. has one Tim Ferriss. There's, I was put on this planet to be KP. So I'm letting go of my cape that's hanging on my, you know, in my wardrobe and trying to like, you know, force fit myself into somebody else's superhuman cape. I am yeah. me. And this secured, confident, deeply grounded feeling of knowing that I do have something to offer and it will come mm -hmm. with enough repetitions and sets and reps, but it will not come in the first five episodes when I'm trying to like feel my film, figure out my voice in the world. When I let that yes. go and stop trying to be like highly produced, highly uh, engineered uh, Tim Ferriss or, you know, take another, um, you know, example, I actually felt so much at ease and, now, after 30 episodes of my podcast, now a lot of people say that I'm so refreshing. I'm so unique. They're like, KP, nobody has this hype energy that you have. Because I don't start my podcast by saying, welcome to KP's podcast. I just say, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm just so hyped. That's who I am in real life. So yeah. what I've learned is that I have to realize that the format is also part of the innovation and part of the gift that I can give to the world. Which means I will yes. first experiment with some dumb formats that won't work which means I have to scope it down, make it smaller, but won't work. Eventually, I'll figure out a format that is perfect for me, along with the yeah. guests and the people and like the ingredients of a great you know, episode in my case. Then it will blow up and become a blockbuster. But I can't <laughs> like download somebody else's playbook and say, oh, yeah, you know, let's just do everything they did because that's what worked you know, and created that blockbuster episode. So I think it extends to many yeah. things. Yes. So I'm noticing we have a few minutes left and I think an interesting place to maybe like wrap up for now is like the idea of inspiration and, and, and pulling it because there's so many directions we could go like tactically, what are some ways to do this mm -hmm. work? That's a different thing. And I think it might be nice to end on inspiration of like what, ins what inspires us like both in the space itself and adjacent or like completely like far off. And I have several ideas, but I'm interested to hear if you want to go first or whatever. So, what inspires me? Is it about community or is it about people? Like, give me a little bit more specificity around this. Um, inspires you regarding, yeah, the, the work of doing community building. Like, like what informs your approach? Yeah. What gets you inspired where you're like, oh, that's a thing I want to like, borrow from. Hashtag like, steal like an artist, Austin right. Leon. Yeah, I know. I, like, I, love, I, know. I love Austin. I, I got the show, your work and a couple other books in, in the back. So um, I think what truly inspires me, especially when it comes to community, is knowing that it is service. And um, 
knowing that when you think about the word service, when you think about the word um, ser phrase serving others, it defaults you to be more other oriented. Um, and the number of minutes I can spend being other oriented in my lifetime, I think is a gift to my own happiness and my own feeling of joy and purpose, you know, because the other defaults we all have as humans, you know, in our society is being self-centered by default, your brain self, you're self-centered. You're worried about your little, you know, you know, your little pinky toe that got hurt. You're worried about your little hairstyle. You're worried about that, this, that. You're always thinking about me, 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 me. In that default setting, being in community, being, you know, um, sir, being in a place where I can choose to serve others, I can choose to help people, empathize with them, listen, care for them, give them advice or give them my tools, techniques, whatever I know, helps me for those few minutes think only about themselves or only about others. And I think that's sort of what inspires me a lot, where I get to be other oriented when I'm doing community. Love that. And what you, it's funny because I 100% agree with everything you said and want to add that for me, it actually does start with myself, mm. right? It's the voice in my own head. It's how am I treating myself? Like, am I a friend in my head to myself? The yeah. voice. And it's if I can extend compassion yeah. to myself when I make mistakes, et cetera, that's who I want to be to mm. others, right? So I've struggled with that, like self-doubt and self-deprecation and criticism is like my deep has been historically mm. my default. So then it's like, I think in working really hard with therapy and with friendship and with family and relation, it's like to become more of this individual person I want to be, then lets me be the person I want to yeah. be to others. So I just want to kind of, it's like yeah. an and, it's like a yet others, but it's yeah. you know, rooted. And then I just want to give shout outs to like a few industry, you know, industries that inspire me. It's like comedians, yeah. amazing. There's so much there to unpack the way that they come on stage and go like, name the one who came before them, acknowledgement, um, amazing therapy, mm. yoga teachers, creating intentional spaces, interior designers, philosophers, storytellers, salespeople, you know, salespeople. It's like they understand you have to follow up with people. You want yeah. to build a relationship. It's not one and done. Um, so many other people, UX, you know, but using it not in like the let's get hook people hooked on technology and using those principles to help people mm. feel connected. So I don't know, a lot there. Shout out to a specific organization called Own Trail, co-founded by Rebecca Bastian and Katie McBratney. I felt seen when I saw that or that website. It's like, just check it out. I mean, it's just What's the like, website? like it's owntrail.com. Okay, cool. Let me check it out. It's like the idea of authenticity and how to do that using tech in workplaces and nice. beyond. Amazing, amazing work. And... I think one little takeaway that I might want to, I don't need to end with it. It's not like a mic drop, but like, this is about like how you are in the world. You don't have to be a person. We talk a lot about titles. It's about recognizing that there's people with emotions on the other side of communication. It means don't ghost people, no, no finger pointing, but when you ghost someone, how does that person right. feel? It's like, don't be a, um, a troll on Twitter. Like when you, you know, brain dump your shitty thoughts, you're making someone right. feel bad. And like, just when someone shares something vulnerable with you over text message, at least give a heart, yeah. like little, little uh, digital communication, we tend to think is like very impersonal, but it's actually a whole different yeah. beast. It's like emojis are self-expression. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. stuff going on in that space. That we just need to give it the recognition yeah. it deserves that at the, you know, this is people. Think so, it's really you know yeah, a lot no, there to unpack, but I just wanted to like. No, it out. I'm so glad you you brought that up, and I'm so glad you sort of you know touched on some of those elements of digital friendships and digital communication. And one thing that I um, want to end on is this notion of empathy with a sympathy. And I thought that was a brilliant point that you know I came across recently. I think I was talking to my sister where she said, you know. Um, thank you for listening to me. And it was like, you know, I just listened for 15 minutes, I think it was not a long time, but she was just, thank you for listening to me. I really feel heard. And I was like, what do you mean listening to you? Cause I was just, I feel like I was talking to you. We were having a conversation. She goes, no, sometimes when I come to you, I feel heard and I feel like you have empathy over sympathy. And I thought I asked her why and how would you define those two things? And she said, sympathy is more like pity 
and and you're trying to like immediately show pity and then move on and asking me to not feel the emotions that I'm mm-hmm. feeling right now. They're imperfect. They're not great. I know them. But when you're showing pity and like saying, "Oh, poor you. Oh, yeah. Well, how about it? can I do this to make you better?" You're trying to brush them away, and they're not gonna go that fast. And what I love about you sometimes, not all the time, is that you let me feel those emotions, um, which is a sign of love. Yeah. And I think on the internet, yes, you know, we can all do more to be more empathetic, not sympathetic. You don't have to say someone's sharing some bad news, someone's venting, someone's riffing. You don't have to go and say, "Oh, so sorry. Oh, poor, poor you." Blah blah blah. But you could just simply say, yeah. acknowledge what they're saying through some digital emoji, like you said, or saying, yeah. "I'm here to talk if you want to." You know, somehow make yeah. them actually really process that emotion. But that can only happen if your cup is full, if you're living and loving and feeling loved, and you know, in love is when mm-hmm. you can share love to others. So. I think it's a delicate dance between self-love and making sure that your bucket's full, your cup's full. But when you when it's almost close to full, pour it into somebody else's cup because that's what they're looking for when they're feeling negative emotions. Yes. They're signaling to you that they're looking for some love and you know acceptance. Um, I think that's a big big thing in whether relationships or community or online or offline. You know, empathy is I think the the key trait you know for our generation. Yes. Awesome. Amazing. Thank you. This is fun. This is fun. Um, yeah. I'm sure you feel the same way. I feel like we could just riff for another 10 hours and not be done with it. I I think we we covered a lot. Um, you're, I appreciate your curiosity. I appreciate your frameworks and your own reflections on some of the things that you know I shared. Um, this is a fun episode. I'm really loving it. I'll probably chop it up in a couple ways and put it on YouTube or put it probably on part of my episodes on my podcast. But Thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you for creating the space for inviting a random person to like, you know, chat. It's great. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Have a good one. See ya.